So this is part of the C++ uh, core C++ conference, uh, co-hosted event, uh, teaching C++. Um, we will join later today the closing, uh, closing keynote of the core C++. So please be with us right after the two sessions, my session now and Yechezkel Bernat. Uh, the two sessions now will speak about uh, C++ 11, C++ 14, this is me, and uh, then Yechezkel will talk about C++ 17 to, to 20. Um, I guess my talk is more relevant for what we teach today, but uh, it is very important to note and think about what we should teach in the future, take this into account. In some cases we um, mentioned that in our lectures that in C++ 20 things will change, things will work otherwise. Uh, you will do it in a, in a bit different way. So I think both lectures are important for teachers. Um, I know that uh, some of you do not teach. Uh, I mean, everybody teaches every day, even if he is not a teacher. But I mean, you are not a full-time teacher uh, by, by, by your uh, uh, job. And uh, still, it is important for us to, uh, to get your input, to get your feedbacks if you come from the industry. Um, if you interview people, what you are looking for uh, C++ uh, juniors, um, and, and we'll have a lecture on that also tomorrow. Uh, so I'm going to, t uh, to talk about the features in C++ 11 and C++ 14. And the talk would not cover all the features. It's not a, a checklist. It's not a list of all features in C++ 11 to C++ 14. There are checklists like that. There are uh, feature lists on the web. Um, I'm, I'm, I will dive into very few items, uh, but the main idea is to, in a way, share with you the experience of teaching C++ 11, C++ 14 to students. So I will cover features. I will cover things that I teach and the way that I teach them or what I'm talking in class and the experience of the students when they see that. So uh, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Amir Kirsch. I teach here at the Academic College of Tel Aviv, uh, Yafo since 1998. I was very young there. Then uh, and and uh, I teach also in uh, Tel Aviv University uh, in both uh, um, institutions. I teach uh, C plus plus. I was working in the industry for uh, a few years, uh, being uh, the chief programmer in Converse. There was a company called Converse back then, um, and we we're doing a lot of C plus plus also. Uh, so I I'm coming with some industry background that. Uh, let me, let me understand what the industry is seeking uh, when, when employing uh, juniors. And this is something that I try to bring with me to class. The language is evolving. Uh, this is uh, uh, the chart that I took from the ISO CPP um, website. The chart itself is changing also. So if you look at it tomorrow, it might be a different chart. Uh, I'm taking the chart to my slides, and every time that I take this, the, the chart, it is a different chart. I go back to uh, previous slides, and I say, hey, it's not the same chart that I took uh, a few months ago. Because things evolve, and even what would go into C++ 20 is something that is being closed during uh, these months. Uh, but we know what is in C++ 11 already. and. Um, the idea or the, the notion that this is a living language and there is evolvement is the reason I think that we have here a conference with more than 300 people from Israel and abroad coming to hear about C++ because C++ is live, is live and kicking. And I think 10 or 20 years ago, um, we would have less people in a C++ conference. There are new projects using C++, and this is the reason, because the language is evolving. But then we need to teach the evolving language. We cannot teach the old language. So uh, we have to start with the uh, very basics. And the very basics with uh, C++11 start with new ways to initialize objects and STD initializer list, and both together. And you then see that when you want to create a thingy, 
you can create a thingy with curly brackets. Why with curly brackets? To avoid the most vexing parse, right? Uh, so maybe you heard about the most vexing parse. If not, you know that Wikipedia has an entry on most vexing parse. It's so important that it is in Wikipedia, okay? Uh, now students, uh, if they don't believe, I ask them, okay, try to write that with uh, round brackets. Uh, and we see, okay, curly brackets do something. It d behaves differently. Um, but it doesn't end there. Because curly brackets means also different narrowing conversion rules. Why? Because the language decided so. In some cases, the students want, uh, they like to, to ask why. And in many cases, my simple answer is because the spec says so. And then, you know, it ends there. Uh, and, and this is why. In some cases, we do discuss why the spec decided to do something in that way, okay? But we don't have the time for that uh, always. So in many cases, I just stop it by that. Uh, but then when initializing uh, with std initializer list, it shares the same syntax, but the different behavior. So uh, if you look at uh, the following lines, uh, there are three lines, what is the difference? I will uh, let you think about that and would not uh, solve it now, but um, I think this one is easy, okay? There is a difference between uh, allocating int without any brackets or allocating it with curly or rounded brackets. But then when we come to other cases, we may find that we have four different cases, okay? The font is a bit small there, so you have to make an effort to focus with your eyes. Uh, there are four std vectors there, all four are on int, and all are initialized with some integer value. The first two are initialized with two, the number two, one with rounded brackets, the other one with curly brackets, and then we have two other std vectors initialized with two ints. One is initialized with curly brackets and the other one is initialized with rounded brackets, okay? Uh, how many different behaviors do you think we, you will have here? So mail is, says four. You are exaggerating, right? No, he's right. Okay, so uh, four different behaviors for something that looks like at least these two should be the same and these two should be the same, but they are not. So I leave you the uh, exercise at home or uh, during the break, okay? You can stay at class during the break and check on an online compiler what is the actual behavior of each of those, okay? Now students look at that and you still have the mission of getting them to love C++. And no wonder it takes only the crazy ones, which we meet later at the conferences and meetups all the unaware ones. But we still have to get them love C++, otherwise, you know, why should we teach them C++ if they are going to program in Java after that? So, okay, we need, we need to teach them that this is why, the, this is how the spec decides and, and that's not so, uh, okay, just use it at, as it should be. And then we come to auto and we say, okay, uh, auto can help you deduce the right type of variables without saying the type yourself, and it is nice because, you know, I don't know the type. Compi you are the compiler. Tell me the type. It's nice. Um, and I still have to say that the language is still statically typed, and they understand that. Uh, and some of them already know JavaScript, and I'm saying, or Python, and I'm saying, no, 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 we are not a scripting language. Uh, the, the, it didn't change the language. We are still statically typed. And then I have to discuss uh, when to use it and, and why, okay? And there are different opinions here. And it, it's nice to hear what they think. Uh, different opinions also in the industry. Um, who says use it always? Almost always. Well, the big shots of, the, uh, the big shots of C++ say, uh, the big shots, I mean, Elb Satter, Bjorn Stilstab, um, Scott Myers, they say use it almost always. On the other hand, a big company that you know that say, uh, don't use it too much. 
Well, the Google style guide is saying don't use it too much. So there are different opinions here, and students do have their own opinion, and um, I also have mine. Um, but, but eventually, okay, they, they have to decide whether they love auto or not, okay? <laughs> so um, uh, after all, auto can help us. Yeah, no, not everybody saw, but, but uh, we had here, it's a geek conference, okay? So we have geek shirts. So uh, yesterday I had another shirt with auto saying something else, but today uh, I'm with uh, I love auto. Um, so the question is, okay, is it a good thing? Yeah, it, it's, it's a good thing. Um, it's mostly a syntactic, syntactic sugaring thing, but it may have efficiency effect. I, I think that the spec doesn't, uh, define, or I don't know, maybe Wikipedia or any encyclopedia uh, defines what is syntactic sugaring. But in general, syntactic sugaring means that you could do the same before with the very same syntax, but it, with this syntax, it's nicer. It's not different. <coughs> so with auto, it's nicer, and it is not different. So it's almost a syntactic sugaring unless, you know, you would do that, but you would do that with a mistake. And um, I think that we will delay the questions till, till the end if we'll have time or, or in the break or if, if it is something very short that maybe we'll go for a question. I just want to relate to a more template generic. Yeah, it sounds like a long question. <laughs> so uh, we'll delay to the end. Okay. Uh, but I have students like that. It's, it's not something new for me. Uh, it's okay. You're a good student. So. Uh, Deducing the variable is nice, but uh, the question is, uh, would it deduce it better than I? And the answer is yes, and this is why it can have a uh, efficiency effect. And the students in some cases do not believe that. And then I do a small program with them, uh, which looks like that in an online compiler, okay? Um, they see the f the, this uh, size of font, but uh, we are a bit uh, older than them. So uh, I will just uh, raise the size a bit, um, and increasing the size a bit more maybe. No, it's fine. So uh, what I'm showing them is, do you know the very basic example of comparisons, uh, comparing uh, auto, auto deduce to another thing, showing that auto deduce the right type, while if you would do that most probably, or in many cases, I found cases like that in the industry, in places that work very hard, on performance, and then right uh, under they see, oh, 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 we do here tons of copies redundantly. And they, they you know, put many efforts on performance. So it's a very, um, it's a known uh, example. Uh, and the example is running, uh, iterating over a map. What is the problem here? What is the bug, I would say, even? We are iterating over a map. We want to get back by reference because we want efficiency. Uh, we take back the pair. Because we don't want to change it, we take back the pair as const. And the bug, and it does compile. And I'm saying you that there are copies here. Suppose it's a pair, not of person to int, a Godzilla to int. Uh, and, and you get copies of the person or the Godzilla. How come? Because what? comes out of the map is not this type. It's another type that can be converted to this type. Now, hey, can I convert thing to a reference? Not to L value reference, but yes, you can convert something to a const L value reference. Um, and this is, this is what's happening here. You convert the pair of const person to int to a pair of person to int, and this conversion creates a new person. So you actually copy all the persons that get out together with a pair that you have to create in a loop that you thought only brings the reference from the container. And students do that. If they do the right thing in their eyes, they say the correct, you know, to reach the point that they know to express this type is a real celebration. And then you say, no, 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 don't do that. Auto is better. But yeah, you have to, uh, in a way, ruin the celebration. Uh, and it's not so bad because uh, the same mistake is done, as I said, in the industry. And the correct 
thing to do is either to do it with auto, like here, okay, like above, and then it works fine because auto deduces the correct type, or to write the correct type. You can say just, okay, this is the correct type, but how can you remember that? You would not. And it's a long type. Okay, so uh, I, I, when I show that to students, they are convinced that, yeah, auto is more than just syntactic sugaring. It is syntactic sugaring at the end because, you know, instead of writing auto, I could write the correct type. Yeah, but I, I'm not sure that I would deduce the correct type because compiler takes six years of compiler uh, um, school and we are taking only four years of CS. Uh, so um, let's, do the, uh, let's let the compiler do their work. Okay, um, so uh, after I'm uh, convincing that auto is fine, uh, use it. Um, and, and it's okay if you do not use it everywhere, but use it where you think you should, like for iterating over pair in a map. Uh, then we go on enums that uh, you have in C++11 class enum to have a context for your class, uh, for your enum constants. And then we go to const expression. And they understand that const is nice, but const is not strong enough because const says it is const, but it, is, it does not say that it is known at compile time. It's easy. They see that. And then we talk about const expression functions because maybe you want to get your const expression value from a function, but then the function needs to be const expression. But if the, if the um, function says that it is a const expression function, and you send to it i and j, can the actual result be also const expression in the last line? The last line is doing const expression, int, result, get the assignment of calling foo with i and j. Can I call foo with i and j and get back? And foo was declared as const expression function. Now, const expression function means that it might be const expression if I send to it const expressions, but it might not be if I just use it with variables which are not const expression. Can the last line compile? Only if i and j are const expression. Yeah, that's true. So if i and j are also const expression, then yes, it's, it compiles, it's okay. This is a const expression. Uh, calling a const expression method function with const expression parameters. Okay, so they get it right. Uh, Sivan was also uh, my student, he got it right. Uh, and uh, range base four, we go to that. And then we see that uh, we can loop over arrays. It's nice. Uh, they ask, can we loop over an array that we got as a parameter to a function? And the answer is, can we get an array in a function and then use range base four to loop over the array that we just got? And the answer is, no, you cannot. You have to know its size, and you know its size only in the scope that the array was declared in. Okay, so when you pass array to a function, you actually pass the pointer, the address of the array, and they understand that. Uh, and then uh, we do use uh, range base four to go through uh, collections, which is very nice because then you do not need to use iterators, or you can delay the point of time where you do reach iterators. So they stick with you in the course more time. And, and you also use auto and const and uh, you even tell them that you can implement range based for, support range based for, for your own types, which is nice. Maybe you even have time to do that in class. And then you reach our value reference, okay? And you have to be strong. Uh, and you tell them that the committee um, decided that ampersand is not being used enough in the language. Uh, which is true, which is true. It's only for bitwise and logical uh, conditions and, and, and get the address operator but, and, and defining a reference. But there is still room. They are thinking about maybe there is still, even still room for additional uh, reference somewhere. Additional ampersand, but okay. We, we want the reference to be somewhere else. Let, let's add it somewhere. Um, so w what's the problem that we want to solve? And, and usually I'm starting with, with the problem that we want to solve. And the problem that we want to solve is that prior to C++11, 
there were inefficiencies in redundant, redundant copying of temporary objects. So uh, when I have a temporary object, and the temporary object is being copied to another one, and the temporary object is, being, uh, is going to be destroyed. But I don't know that. So the only possible way to do that is to actually copy, even though I may know as a programmer that is going to be destroyed. So when getting a return, value by, a return from a method by value, there is no other way to do that. But in some cases, return by value, then I'm copying. Uh, adding objects to, uh, to the container, I'm copying. Now, it's true that the compiler itself has uh, return value optimization and copy elision. And when we do programs in class and I want to um, show something, you know, in many cases, in a simple program, you cannot show that temporary object create copy. Why? Because of the optimizations. So what uh, should we do? I'm using the compiler flag minus F no elite constructors. And I have to be in C14, not in C17, because in C17, what happens in C17, in Haskell? Uh, in C17, copy elision is, uh, is part of the language. Okay, the compiler is obliged to do that. So I'm, uh, I want to show that in simple cases, there are redundant copies. Now, I explained that in non-simple cases, in more complicated cases, the compiler cannot do the optimization, okay, because it cannot follow. It's not a static uh, code analysis tool or something like that. It cannot follow how the object will travel. So in, in simple cases, you do the, the compiler does the, the optimization. In other cases, not. And I want to show how it works in simple cases. And this is why I put the minus F, no elite constructors. But don't do that only just to, to see things. You do want the optimization. OK, so and they understand. And they are, I think they understand the rationale behind having our value reference to know, to identify, with the help of the compiler, that we have here a reference of an object that is about to die. So what can we do with, an R, with a reference of an object that is about to die? So suppose that we have a frightening Godzilla, a factory that creates a frightening, frightening Godzilla, and the frightening Godzilla comes back from um, a method that creates it, and it creates it uh, not as a um, allocation. It's not newly allocated object. It's a local object. So I get it back by value. Now, I know that it is going to be dead at the end of the statement because this one is a temporary object. And I prefer to, how would I say it uh, politely, to steal it, OK, if I can, because I know that you are about to die. Please give me your assets. You don't need them. So this is what I want to do. And they understand that this is something that might be more efficient. Uh, and the way to do that is to have two different functions, uh, overloading. It is uh, valid overloading, two different kind of references. One is there. Remember, we are not using uh, uh, ampersand enough. We need to use it more. So uh, the two ampersands. And, and they think that I'm joking at the, the first, uh, especially if the lesson falls on, on Apple first. So uh, yeah, the, there is a difference between the two methods, and they understand that. And then you have to go to this uh, table. No, no other choice. You have to, uh, to, to explain the overload resolution, how the compiler decides where to go. And it's not so, so simple, but uh, you have to go through that. And you still have the mission to get student life C++. No wonder it takes only the crazy ones who come to like to conferences like this one uh, or the anywhere. And then you go to the rule of three, which started with C++ 98. It's not something new, but it changed a bit because now you can do equals delete. Okay, this is the C++ 11 new syntax, which is nice. Okay, so under, they understand that if you have a destructor or your class is managing resources, First thing you have to do is to block the copy constructor and the assignment operator. And, and they are, by the way, very happy about that. Because what I'm telling them that in the exercise, they do not have to implement copy constructor and assignment operator. They are allowed to block them unless they feel that they need them. 
Okay? And of course, this is better than just leaving them if this is a not, uh, if this is a class who manages resources. But it, is, it doesn't stop there, right? What comes next? The rule of five, okay? So uh, you have also move constructors. Uh, move constructor and move assignment operator. And maybe you want the default, or maybe you do not want the default. And if you wrote one of the five, then there is a rule of what happens to the others. And they have to know that, because you will ask them about that in the exam. And there is also something about no except. There is also something about rule of zero before that. Uh, this is important. In some cases, we don't have time, so we skip in class the important parts. But this is an important part. And in some cases, we skip that because, you know, not much to teach about that. But the thing to teach here is that the best thing is not to have any destructor and any copy, uh, any of the five, OK? Uh, and, and it means that, OK, I'm, I'm using OOP in the right way. And it's important to, to talk about that and understand, because in the industry, we prefer to have classes that do not manage resources. So use string, use uh, STD containers, use uh, smart pointers. Don't manage your own resources. Let somebody else do that. And then uh, we have to talk about move. Because if we want to implement the move operations, then they have to know how to use STD move and know the difference between implementing a move this way, which means I have a move that doesn't work, do copy, or I'm having the correct way of doing std move or, or doing move operation with std move. And then when they understand that, I'm saying them to I'm saying to them wait, but you have to know that std move doesn't move. So ask they ask. So, so what were we talking about previously? And I'm saying it's not this one that did the move. It's this one that did the move. It was just an helper, OK? So why do we call it tested move? Because this is what the spec decided. OK, this is how the spec decided. So tested move doesn't move. And OK, but wait. There is something else to say about move if no except. Well, you don't really have to know it. And you know, when you tell the students that you don't really have to know it, it will not be in the exam. So Part of them disappear, and it's OK. They will not interfere. And the others just open their ears because they want to listen. And that's nice. That's good. OK, so you have to know something else about move if no except, or maybe should, or shouldn't. So OK, this would not be for the exam, also here in this class. Uh, there are some rules about how containers can move things if I create move operations with no accept or without no accept. So uh, I explained that, and uh, usually the, the smart ones do get it, OK? The others just de decided not to listen. But wait, it's not the end. Because maybe we need also to talk about STD forward. Well, we don't really have to discuss STD forward at this point of time. Why? Because STD forward is more relevant to templates. Right? SD4 becomes relevant when we work with templates. So it relates mostly to templates, which would be discussed later in the semester. But there is a student who insists. He heard from his sister, who took this course two years ago, that there is also something called SD4. So he needs to know the difference now. And OK, eventually, you know, you have uh, feedbacks at the end of the semester. And uh, every semester you get that the uh, teacher doesn't answer questions in class. So you decide, OK, let's, let's try to answer the question. What is the difference? And why do you have SD4? Then we'll talk about that when we'll talk about templates. But let's have a short answer, OK? Two minutes answer. Why do we need STD forward? So you give a quick example for STD forward in class. Suppose that I want to forward something. Suppose that I got, and, and you have no other choice but to give the actual real example with templates. So we say, suppose that I have some kind of template that got a T parameter, and I want to forward the T parameter to some uh, dispatching function that should get T. 
okay, and I want to pass t the way that I got it, okay? I got it, I want to dispatch it the way that I got it. It was our value, I want to dispatch it to forward it on as our value. I got it as an L value, I want to dispatch it to forward it on as an L value. And it sounds reasonable, okay? I managed to do it in one or two minutes, and he's happy for a moment, but wait. He then realizes that the previous slide makes no sense. He is a smart student. Here it is again. What's wrong here? Why doesn't it have any sense? I, I'm saying to the student that you need STD forward because you got something and you want to forward it on with the same reference type as you got it. Okay, but he says, wait, I don't understand it. It makes no sense. We get it as an R value. You can just pass it, out, pass it on with STD move. He listened. He got the STD move right. I could do STD move because, you know, I got something that looks like something that can be moved, and I just have to pass it, out, pass it, pass it on as STD move. So I have to tell him, well, you are technically <coughs> right, dear student. If it was indeed an R, an R value, but it is not. It's a forwarding reference, also known as universal reference, a direct result of the re reference collapsing rule. And now he is quiet. <laughs> okay, but uh, it didn't really answer his question because I, you know, at the end, I had to use some uh, magic words that didn't really help him. So, uh, well, I have, uh, I've warned you, we don't really have to discuss it now, right? Okay, what's next? What do we have else in C++11? So, we have override. Override is good. Override, all students understand override, I guess. Uh, you give a very simple example and they understand that putting override on a virtual method that I inherited from the base, I say something for the compiler, I'm asking the compiler, dear compiler, can you check on me, please? And they like it because they usually come to me and ask me, can you check my program, please? And I ask, him, I ask them, did you ask the compiler to check first? No, 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 we want you to, to, to look at it first. So they like the compiler to check for them, that's nice. But then I have to talk about final maybe, and final is a whole different thing, and I have to say, you know that, what, it will not be for the exam. Uh, smart pointers. Uh, I said before, I'd start with the rationale, and the rationale for smart pointers is very easy, and they like it. They, they totally like it when they, they understand that we are going in a way to dismiss row pointers. They say, yeah, go for it. Yeah. But then we come to STD unique PTR, and we say, okay, you create a unique PTR uh, with make unique, and then you do STD move. Uh, to pass it on to another one, and when you want to pass it to another method, you have again to do STD move. And then they say, can we go back to row pointers? We like them. Uh, movable but not copyable? What are you talking about? What is movable but not copyable? And how can we use it? Like that, I, I just show you. Okay, so you have to park on it a bit. Uh, and when they feel a bit secure, they say, we think we got it. 50%, okay, we got, uh, they go out, we got 50 percent of the, okay, so you say, okay, well, wait, there are also shared PTR and weak PTR, and uh, there is a thread uh, safety that you have to consider, and they say, are you sure? How much more uh, do we have more for the exam? Well, you have a bit more, you have a bit more, you have just Lambda expressions with capture by value and capture by reference. C++14 generic lambda, C++14 capture expression, and then you have some to cover some of the STD containers, algorithms, function objects. Uh, maybe a bit about templates, you know, the basic templates, type and non-type templates, variadic templates, because they, they need to uh, know how to forward parameters like we do in make unique, make shared. I want them to understand how make unique works. So they need to know how variadic templates work. And maybe we'll do some specialization and forwarding reference. Remember the T, double ampersand? Remember? 
fold, folding reference, we have to talk about that, and as FINA and STD enable. Um, and, and if we have time, maybe STD thread. So in, in Tel Aviv University, it's a non-mandatory course for the third year. I do STD thread here. It's a second year course. I do not reach STD concurrency. But uh, um, yeah, you have enough till then. So how, how is it to teach C++ is 11? Well, uh, it's more material that we had in the past that makes our lives easier in one way because smart pointer is good, but complicates them in all new ways. And you are not even supposed to use new. But you still have to know new and delete, right? Last important note. It's almost a new language. So you have to make sure you update your resources and bookshelf. Do that. Thank you very much. So, Mayor, I think that I have five minutes for uh, questions. For the comment about autism, but I can stand up. Can I stand up for a minute? Yeah, stand up. Because I want to turn around as well. Oh, you also have a shirt. OK. Grandma, I will uh, read what uh, Mayor's shirt says. Grandma, I don't use new and delete in my C++ code anymore. Whoa, that's great. I wrote that. OK? I prepared the shirts for the conference, so uh, I like it as well. And there is one also, uh, don't auto me. I'm a person P. <laughs> Any other question? Yeah. Daniel. So is not speaking C++ on a daily basis. Um, do you think that today we still have to teach the old-fashioned C++ as an expert in a new one? Or should we just teach it? Or are you going to teach the new stuff? And like... Because the old ones, old things are not good So the question Daniel asked, um, with the new features of C++, do we have to teach the old features? Um, I would add to it, do we have to start with raw pointers or start with smart pointers and then maybe later on open under the hood and say, you know, there is a pointer underneath. So the question is where to start, to start with Charles Star or to start with Stood String? Now, there are many answers for that. And for this, I uh, recommend you to go for Kate Gregory lecture, uh, given, I think, several times in CppCon on stop teaching C, which means when you teach C++, teach C++, and stop teaching the C parts of C++, teach students how to use smart pointers and not how to use pointers, etc. It's a good approach. It's not exactly what I'm doing. I'm, I do, uh, in, in uh, year uh, at the Academic College of Tel Aviv, we start with C on the first year. So after they know C and I go to smart pointers, uh, I have to, un to, to explain in a way what is a smart pointer that, and they understand it by you know, comparing it to a pointer. So I do start from the basic. But uh, it makes sense that if you start with Java or start, start with Python and then you go to C++, Maybe you do not have to start with pointers. You can start with, like for example, when we use a um, file, use an object to work with a file, we do not go to the operating system, or maybe in another course, to understand how file works. We just use the, you know, the high level mechanics. So again, uh, with pointers, we can use the high level mechanics. Same thing with strings. And this is the argument that Kay Gregory uh, takes in, in her uh, lecture, and I, I recommend watching it. It's on YouTube. You can find it. Uh, any other question? Please. Maybe a couple of, uh, maybe a couple of uh, words. What's your opinion about uh, the difference between teaching, uh, te teaching people who don't know uh, C++ at all and teaching co-workers who actually program in it in some capacity? Okay, so, so the question was uh, the difference between teaching uh, a beginner, teaching someone who do not know C++ at all, but I guess know maybe C? Familiar with programming. Okay, familiar with programming, uh, as opposed to compared to uh, someone who writes C++, your co-worker, 
your colleague at work will know parts, know something about C++. So uh, I would say that when you work with someone, you go to the actual examples in code. You start coding, you do things, and then you explain, okay, we're using here shared PTR because shared PTR gives you these abilities, and you go, in a way, top, bottom. And my approach in some of the cases is, is to build things bottom up. But still, when you teach juniors, you, you, know, you mix it. You do some bottom up because you want them to understand how Charles Star creates a string. This is my approach. Even though Kate, Kate Gregory would say start with SD string. Okay? On the other hand, there are things that I would go top bottom. So I, I think that the mix would be that with a coworker, you would start uh, top bottom because you know the, the top is uh, what the, the assignment, the task, what we are going to do. You usually do not understand every bit and byte in the code of the company. You just call a method and it should do the work, we hope. Uh, on the other end, uh, in an actual course, you do want them to understand what is going on beneath. Thank you very much, all. Uh, another question, last one. As if you can tell us as, um, as lecturers, when, how many semesters of C++ you have when you're talking about your teaching C and then C++ and when you teach everything? Yeah, so uh, first of all, we will have later today a panel about teaching C++. Uh, Iris will uh, lead the panel, and we have several people here in the audience who would yeah. be sitting in the panel. So you will have your answers, and I will have their, my answers. And uh, here at the Academic College of Tel Aviv, they have uh, first year uh, learning C, two semesters, and then they uh, learn C++ on the third semester, on their second year. Uh, in Tel Aviv University, they switched. Uh, in the past, they uh, learned C++ as a mandatory course. Now, in many institutions today, not only in Israel, uh, C++ is gone, is uh, up at the attic, uh, as a non-mandatory course. <coughs> there is a very old blog post on that by Joel Spolsky. Have you heard about Joel Spolsky? He's known now as being the co-founder of Stack Overflow. So Joel Spolsky has a very old uh, uh, post on uh, how it is called. The perils of uh, Java schools, right? Uh, and and he, he in a way, uh, mock, in a way, the institutions that go with, go with Java. At the end, it's only programming language. It doesn't really matter where you start. And he says that it does matter. Because if you start uh, with the difficult things, then you get the good programmers. And it's not that you will, at the end, necessarily program in C++. It might be that you are going to program in Java, but you will be a better programmer if you get the challenges in C++, as you see, um, gives us some of, uh, some of these challenges. So I don't know. I believe that C++ is, in, is important because you understand things. Uh, here, we have many uh, graduates who go to the C++, to the industry with C++. Some of them sit here. Uh, um, and, and I think this is important. Thank you very much. I think that we have a 10 minutes break, right? <laughs>